Well, now that we know a little bit more about light, let's follow that light as it makes its way into the eyes of the telescope. And a telescope's primary function is to gather lots of light, way more light than our puny little eyes can gather. So right away, we want large apertures, large diameters are important. And they are associated with high expense to get the kind of resolution and quality that's required. Well, there are, as we said, lots of other wavelengths of light, but visible is extremely important, so we have plenty of optical telescopes. And of course, on the surface of the Earth, that is one of the main ones that we can use. The other wavelengths are mostly not available. Here's an example of the twin 10-meter Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And you can see here a man sitting in the at the center of this telescope. So there are really giant eyes. A lens makes an image that's upside down and inverted. Well, it's saying the same thing, flip back and forth and in inverted. And it's on the focal plane where the image is formed. The eyeball does essentially the same thing. So that's how the eyeball works in brief. And you can trace the various rays through. There's rules for that producing an object, an image of an object. Camera operates similarly. It's a little bit closer to how a telescope works now because the image is formed on the focal plane, but at the focal plane you put a detector, like a charge couple device. So telescopes, expensive telescopes, have very expensive high-tech CCDs. There are two basic telescope types, and first of all, the easiest to think of just light coming through a lens. And if it does, especially parallel rays, like from a star, they will converge at a focal point. And the distance from the lens to that point is called the focal length. If the lens is curved more, it'll bend the light more, and therefore the focal point will be less distance, resulting in a smaller focal length. Here's a refractor. A refractor is made from that principle. The bending of the light converges to an eyepiece, and then the eyepiece basically magnifies the image. This is a image or picture of a relatively inexpensive refracting telescope. So we have an object here that's not so far away like a star, but the various paths of the light will converge and produce an image on the focal plane, as you see there. The other kind of telescope is in the reflector. And it does just what it sounds like it's doing, which is reflecting light. So you can see the light coming in, reflecting off the primary mirror to a secondary mirror, bouncing off of that, and then to the eyepiece again. Here is a amateur, uh, medium priced, medium quality, reflecting telescope. Looks very similar in principle, especially to the refractor. The light bounces off instead of going through like a lens and forms an image here in front of the mirror instead of on the other side of the lens. The secondary optics are the, you know, the mirrors that are used to bounce the signal and also the eyepiece itself. Refractors have limitations in their usefulness for astronomy, especially professional astronomy. They have different distortions, and a primary one is what's called chromatic aberration, chromo color aberration problem. Namely, that different wavelengths are focused at different focal points. It's really uh, the physics that's known as dispersion, where shorter wavelengths of light are bent more blue than longer wavelengths of light, like red, and therefore the focal point is at different places for the different colors. Well, where are you going to put the CCD to focus the image when the different colors from the image focus at different places? So that's a problem. One way to partially overcome it is with a secondary lens. It brings it together in part with this achromatic lens, but it doesn't do the whole job. It just helps. So there's still a problem. 
Moreover, lenses have to be ground perfectly on both sides. It's very difficult from a technological engineering standpoint. The glass itself must be flawless. It's very expensive to produce that kind of glass. The sheer weight of the glass itself deforms it. Glass is actually a fluid. If you put a glass bottle on a desk and come back in a thousand years, if the building hasn't already crushed in, which it probably will have, you'll see that the glass has sagged. And when you have multi-ton lenses in these huge telescopes, the weight of its own material is going to deform it. And any deformation at all is going to be hugely problematic for professional astronomy. This is the largest telescope that was ever produced as far as refractors go. So it has a 40 inch lens. It's the Yerkes telescope in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, not too far from Chicagoland. So that's a pretty awesome telescope. I've been there multiple times. You might notice this character here. This telescope was built in the late 1800s and uh, Einstein sits standing there on the platform that's still being used to this day. You can go to the Yerkes Observatory and get a tour, see that telescope. It's a pretty awesome sight. Edwin Hubble spent some time observing at the Yerkes Observatory. Now all current telescopes, the big ones, they're all some kind of reflector design because of these limitations with refractors with the glass. So here is that amazing telescope and in this huge dome, it takes a really big dome to house a telescope. This thing is, I believe, 40 feet long and here's a older picture of the observatory and a little more current. So what constitutes a powerful telescope? Let's discuss the powers. They are light gathering, angular resolution, and magnif magnification. Notice I put magnification at the end of the list. There's a reason for that. The main thing is light gathering because it's got multiple positive effects. Larger diameter. The area of a circle is pi r squared. And so the area just depends on the surface area of the main lens or mirror, whichever the case. A good telescope needs to have a large diameter so it can gather lots of light. It's as simple as that. The second thing is angular resolution. You want a lot of, uh, you want good angular resolution, which means that you can resolve two objects that are far away, like say the headlights of a car. Anybody can see that there's two lights if the car is close because this angle is large. But what happens when the car is a long ways away? Then the angle gets real small. If you can still separate the two lights, distinguish them from one, then you have good angular resolution, which means the angle is very small where you can still resolve features. That's really like high def versus regular video, 240p versus 1080p, something like that. With a 1080p you can see a lot more detail, smaller features you can distinguish from adjacent ones. As an example, here's the Andromeda Galaxy taken with a low resolution telescope. Same galaxy with a higher resolution telescope, which really means large diameter. So larger diameter not only collects more light, but it gives you greater angular resolution, which means you can, s you can see much finer detail. Very important. And last, but probably least, is magnification. High magnification does not improve the quality of the image, so keep that in mind. I couldn't resist putting this ad on this slide for the Barska 600 power Star Watcher refractor. Sale price $69. Here it is. This is very bad advertising. Appealing because who doesn't want 600 power? Bring in the man in the moon from off the surface of the moon, you know, um, or look at a distant mountain and see the gleam in the eyes of the bird that's on top of a tree. Anyway, you don't get effective 600 power out of a telescope like this. You have to take one of these zeros off at least. 60 power would be about the maximum useful 
magnification, especially in relatively light polluted skies, you do not want very much magnification. The light that you're seeing dims a lot, the distortions increase. You wouldn't even be able to find the object, or if you do find it, you wouldn't be able to keep it in view. So it's totally useless at these higher powers. Generally low powers is what you're interested in. In my opinion, if you're interested in a telescope, the best entry telescope, and maybe, maybe even beyond that, is a Dobsonian, pictured here you get the most bang for the buck. It's got a wonderful, wonderfully simple mounting system that you can just move around. It's not all electronically controlled, but even though that seems really wonderful to an initial prospective buyer, it can also keep you from really effectively using it. And you pay a lot of money that you don't get much out of. So get a six inch or eight inch or a 10 inch Dobsonian and you're really on the right track. Here's the way in which the optics is set up in the Dobsonian and you know magnification we're still on getting magnification is really simple it's just the ratio of the focal length of the primary to the focal length of the eyepiece it's just a simple formula if you want more magnification all you have to do is decrease the focal length of the eyepiece get an eyepiece with a short focal length and then you have a small number here compared to this number, and you've got lots of magnification. But again, not very important. There's an adequate magnification for any given telescope, and an optimal one for any given viewing circumstance. And that just takes some practice. Well, I hope you realize this is a joke. This is not what professional telescopes are used for. You don't just sit there and count stars. Now that you know what telescopes are not used for, what are they used for? Well, imaging, and we've discussed the idea of filters, getting different features, different wavelengths, and you combine those together into a composite, and you get these beautiful visible and other types of images that are multi-wavelength images. And so sometimes there's a whole lot of separate images that combine together to produce the final result, which can be quite spectacular. Spectroscopy is this breaking down of light, light coming in through the telescope, off a diffraction grating, which is like a prism, which spreads out the light, which is then analyzed and taken to a computer. And we'll discuss more how that light can be. The information discerned from the spreading out of that light and seeing what the various wavelengths are doing or not doing. And then we have timing as well. So you take a picture of a galaxy and you see a supernova. There is a supernova. Well, it's not just good enough to take that one snapshot. You need to look at it over a period of time. So over a period of many days, even months, you obtain the light curve by analyzing the particular light, the photons that are being emitted and you can graph it out and study events such as a supernova and get all kinds of information about in detail what's going on. So where do you want to put a telescope? Well, one of the worst places would be, oh, somewhere around here. <laughs> you see all the human-made light. You want to get away from that and get to dark areas where there isn't so much light pollution. And this kind of is a nice image of the whole world and showing where those regions are that are not so optimal. And when you live in a place like this, you just got to find your little nooks and crannies that are the best that you can do. Things are changing rapidly. This is the in uh, Arizona, 1959. You can see the amount of skylight. Far less than 30 years later, 1989. Look at all the light pollution that shines into the sky, scatters off particles in the atmosphere and really makes it hard for an astronomer to do their thing. Best location for a telescope then is away from all that light pollution, way up high in the thin atmosphere, get out of most of the atmosphere where it's cool, low turbulence, clear skies, calm, dry, all those things are very useful and that's where the major observatories are then built. Astronomical observing is always a series of compromises. You never have perfect scene conditions. So here's bad scene versus relatively good scene. And 
the optics plays into this, but significantly the Earth's atmosphere. So how can we counter the bad conditions of the atmosphere? Well, let's see what we can do. It's called adaptive optics. At least that's a major way in which, with recent technology, we've been able to significantly counter some of these negative effects. We have computer-controlled servos that dynamically compensate for distortions in the atmosphere. And amazingly, we can send a powerful laser beam through the atmosphere, sampling the conditions of the atmosphere with a feedback signal that is computer controlled, causing the telescope to dynamically, in real time, adjust to compensate for the distortions. Distortions like refraction. If you put a pencil in water, you see it bent. Well, the atmosphere does that to a beam of light. So, light from a star coming into the atmosphere, all these negative conditions impact what you're going to see. You've heard a twinkle, twinkle little star. How I wonder what you are. Well, now you know what that twinkle is. The twinkling is the distortion of the various wavelengths of light coming in. So you're seeing the light coming in at different angles, making it appear as though the star is jumping around a little bit. Here is adaptive optics off versus on. Huge difference. Here's images of Neptune taken with and without adaptive optics. So we've been able to really make a lot of headway in improving the images that one can obtain through the atmosphere. Because putting, putting satellites out beyond the atmosphere like Hubble is not that easy to do, and it's very expensive. Just a quick note on a couple of mounting types. We have what's called the equatorial mount, which is basically taking the telescope and aligning a polar axis with, you guessed it, the pole. So here's to the north pole, the north star, this is the north pole of Earth. You set the telescope with one axis aligned in that direction. As the Earth rotates like this, looking from above, that's counterclockwise, you rotate the telescope exactly at the same rate clockwise to just compensate for that effect. Once you have the star in view, the right ascension is taken care of. It keeps pointing to the same place. And all you have to do is change the declination is, is altered to get the view of the star in place. And then the, the polar axis, taking care of the right ascension, will keep it in view. So that's just a nice way to only use, have to have one clock drive keeping the telescope on the object. There's alt azimuth mounting, and that in crude form looks like this. You have to, you have to computer control both the rotation and elevation, so the azimuth and altitude. And computers are very well able to do that. And really large telescopes, sometimes the mounting is easier to get robust with this sort of system. And it's no problem for the computers to control both axes. So just a few examples of modern telescopes. Here again we see the Titans on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, 10 meter diameter telescopes. Diameter. The large binocular telescope. That is the biggest pair of binoculars you've ever seen. Space telescope observatories. We have the Hubble for visible light. We have the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is got infrared eyes. We have the Chandra X-ray Observatory. The wavelength of preference of design is in the name. And we have the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory. So these space observatories, of course, enable us to get a view at these wavelengths that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. Future telescopes. This is really an amazing project. The European Extremely Large Telescope. Really catchy name there, isn't it? 42 meter diameter. So I hope that project comes to fruition. That'll be an incredible instrument if it actually gets built. Then radio astronomy. 
Radio astronomy is very important. We've discussed it in brief. You have a large dish focusing the energy of a radio signal into a receiver. And that information is stored in computers and converted images, etc. And radio astronomy is useful because it reveals things with those long wavelengths that other wavelengths do not reveal. One thing it can do is go right through the dust and gas of galaxies. You can detect neutral hydrogen clouds, basically looking at the emission coming from hydrogen, which is the most prominent atom and molecule in the universe, and it will reveal to you where new stars are forming. So really, really important to be able to see hydrogen gas. And also molecules. There's dozens of molecules that have been de detected and oftentimes these molecules are revealing themselves in space through radio frequencies. And this is very similar to the satellite dish that you might have on the roof of your house. So that's pretty much what we're talking about. We have a dish with a little receiver and the signal goes into a very sensitive receiver in your house amplified and you can watch your TV shows. The largest radio telescope would be the one in Arecibo, 300 meters, Puerto Rico. This has been highlighted in movies in the past. This one is not steerable. There's a natural depression in this mountainous area and that to get Focus in different areas of the sky, it's a, got a steerable receiver. Then radio interferometry, the combining of signals into one. So the resolving power of a telescope depends on its diameter. Don't worry about this formula, but you want this angular resolution, as we talked about, to be good, which means this is going to be small, which means the diameter needs to be big. This is wavelength. The wavelength of radio is very large. That would cause this to be large. So you need a big diameter here in order to get proper resolution. So you want high resolution. And so a way to get that is, here's three telescopes. Combine the signals electronically to effectively get a very large dish that's effectively making D very big. So the problems are indicated, namely that the wavelength is very large, so we need a very big D to compensate for that. So this is called interferometry, combining of the signals together. We have the very large array that in New Mexico that has 27 dishes that can literally simulate a dish of 36 kilometers in diameter. The resolution is greatly enhanced as a result of this. What about future astronomical projects? What about the moon? It's got a lot of appealing conditions, but then even though you mitigate the eff negative effects of the atmosphere, light pollution, you need a lot of money. And as you know, that's usually pretty hard to come by. So that'll conclude our little segment here on light and telescopes.